Okay, so I'm just informing that I'm uh, going to record this session as we aim to publish this online afterward as a video. So if you have any problem, um, I think you already given consent anyway, but um, let me start. So um, I hope you can all hear me well. Um, as far as I understand, some people already confirmed that. Uh, I would like to thank you all for registering and participating in this online event that um, there are most consortium is organizing. Uh, today, this is uh, basically a first webinar of a series that we would like to uh, to have uh, in the years to come, uh, just to promote our cause, uh, show some uh, uh, some of the work that has been done, but basically starting from the basics, understanding the different disciplines that are involved in this uh, project, and try to basically deliver the message, disseminate our results, and also uh, the research potential will bring along and innovation, of course, schemes that uh, you will hear a lot of things about it uh, later on. So uh, this uh, this first uh, webinar is basically um, uh, organized as the pretty basic things about radioactivity, especially in the marine environment, the depth of the ocean. Um, I will try to cover um, some of the very fundamental things, elements that are required to understand what's going on. Uh, not only in the marine environment, but also around us in the universe, in the terrestrial ecosystem we live in, and try to really focus on the marine environment, which is uh, something that we've been pursuing the last uh, couple of years, at least, uh, some of us, uh, some of them longer, um, and uh, to give the science and uh, all the, uh, the, the useful things that uh, are related to humanity, protection, safety, but also the ecosystem. So I would like to welcome all in the University of Athens. As I said, this is a series we've been starting uh, basically um, uh, in the webinars, webinars uh, that I uh, would like to extend in the future. Um, and uh, today, actually this week, not only today, this webinar coincides with uh, the United Nations Ocean Conference 2022 uh, in Lisbon, where some of the Ramon's partners, also present here, uh, have participated, they have an active role. Um, the importance of oceans is uh, extreme, uh, extremely um, uh, significant for our uh, project, but uh, also for the humanity and uh, the planet itself. It's a huge, vast ecosystem, and um, all of the components over there are really um, need to be studied. We have to find the criticality levels at some points uh, that we will also say a few things later on. And um, they give us lots of opportunities also for research, sustainability, understanding our world, and try to uh, to improve our lives and quality of lives only for human beings, but also for other uh, beings that uh, reside on this planet, on this uh, blue dot in the center of the universe. So as a small outline, a brief outline of what I'm going to cover today, I will start, as I said, from the pretty basics, uh, just cover little things about the atoms and nuclei. I will uh, talk about the fundamental property of uh, nuclei, especially radioactivity and uh, transmutation. Um, give some um, very basic uh, knowledge about it and how this uh, effects that are associated with nuclei and radioactive nu nuclei drives our research and knowledge. Uh, I will try to make it a little more focused, of course, on the ocean ecosystem. That's all about uh, today and see how we can combine the fundamental knowledge with something that can be a little more on the applied level where uh, we should use this information and knowledge um, to really uh, provide solutions for open uh, problems and uh, other uh, questions that uh, currently have no answer. Um, in the process of the, of the whole um, uh, webinar, one of the major things and major aspects that I would like to really approach, and maybe, maybe I think I will only scratch a little bit, is uh, what we try to bring in uh, as a Ramon's consortium um, in detectors, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, geosciences, uh, risk analysis, and uh, many other things. Basically, the innovative approaches and aspects that we would like to have um, and achieve by the horizon at the end of this, uh, this project. Uh, one of the major aspects, of course, when you talk about this vast ecosystem, this ocean ecosystems, is trying to get the risks out of it. It, it. it can be natural hazard, it can be man-induced hazards, uh, but it would be nice with uh, whatever innovative approaches we bring in, uh, with new systems, novel equipment, uh, techniques, uh, algorithms, we'll try to really get the risk out of it, uh, find some uh, solutions or propose some solutions, inform the public, inform governments, but also try to protect the environment, the human uh, communities. This is um, more or less the outline of the talk, and uh, I would say five chapters, let's say, in this uh, webinar. Um, so I'll start with the basics, and uh, please, I would like to ask uh, some excuse from the more specialists in the field, uh, 
who probably know it better than I do. So atoms and nuclei, we know very well today, of course, after a hundred or so years, uh, that the whole universe is composed of some minute, tiny building blocks. We call them atoms. These building blocks are basically uh, completely invisible to our eyes. And typically we like to represent them um, as a small solar, uh, solar system where you have uh, a center and you have some orbits where uh, some tiny particles called electrons uh, orbit the nucleus of the, of the electron uh, as the planet's uh, circle orbits around the, uh, around the sun. Uh, this uh, pedantic, pedantic uh, basically uh, picture is, is useful if you would like to understand the concepts and the structure of the atom. However, it has nothing to do with reality. As we very well know today that the classical physics really failed to uh, represent or describe the systems. We have to rely on quantum mechanics and um, with the giant leaps in quantum mechanics theory, but also experiments, we are now in position and we have the ability to even make small photographs uh, of atoms, basically of the wave function as they call them, uh, in uh, these uh, tiny systems. For example, this uh, right picture on uh, uh, the blue is uh, a, screen, a screen capture, basically, an evolution of the wave function of the hydrogen atoms, where you can clearly see um, some center of where the nucleus resides and the first excited state of the electrons around. This is, uh, of course, uh, completely different, but I will keep the more uh, pedantic, as I said, picture for the rest of the, um, of the slides, uh, just to uh, really pinpoint the concepts that I would like to, to show you uh, in the few uh, four or five slides. Of course, this story is also um, uh, started a long time ago, despite it, it a more philosophical leg legend by the atomic philosophers. Here's uh, Democritus on 100 drachmas banknote uh, bill uh, that's been long out of circulation. So this atom has structure. This point we call the building block and all of the matter, all bodies around have uh, uh, this kind of um, uh, uh, structure. They, are consi they consist of atoms. Uh, they are not really fundamental in the sense that uh, it's one single portion of matter. It has structure. And this structure inside, we, today we understand, thanks to uh, pioneering experiments already from the beginning of the 1900s, we know that the center there's a very massive particle we call the nucleus, and around we have some light particles that we call electrons, as I said, that orbit this uh, very heavy and positively charged uh, center. Somebody could say, okay, now we have other building blocks, another category of building blocks, even smaller than the atom. However, if you look at the nucleus, we'll find that the game is not over. The nucleus itself has structure and actually consists of other building blocks we call proton and neutron. And they are basically the nucleons. These are the constituents of nuclei of the center of the atom. And what we focus today is basically those properties of proton and neutrons in the nucleus as they affect and shape basically the behavior of atoms in general. So this, um, the protons are positively charged um, um, bodies and neutrons are, uh, perhaps it's implied already by its name, are completely neutral, they don't have any charge, so they don't have any electromagnetic uh, interactions uh, among each other. Um, the interesting part is that if you would like to see if these protons and neutrons are the building blocks as fundamental particles, this is again not the, the case. These are also composite systems, composite particles, um, uh, we know today that they actually have these quarks as contents, but I'm not going to go into these details uh, today. So what can we take uh, out of it? First of all, we can take the structure. We can understand there is a fundamental situation down there in the subatomic world, as we call it. Uh, and we have to understand all the properties. This is, of course, an objective in fundamental science. And today we know a lot of things, actually. We know uh, we have a lot of information about the behavior, about the interactions, about the energy that's been hidden, how it's transformed. And one basic fundamental property, as I, I keep saying, is basically that we can combine different protons and neutrons inside an atom. So this is important because an atom basically is characterized, or a chemical element, I would say uh, more correctly, a chemical element is characterized by a specific number of protons. So if you have, for example, six protons, then you have an atom of carbon. If you have eight, it's oxygen. If you have 92, it's uranium and so on. So basically the whole chemistry is defined by the number of protons and the associated number of electrons that in a, a neutral atom basically equalizes the number of protons. However, a different force that exists inside the nucleus, we call the strong nuclear force, is responsible for keeping together both protons but also neutrons, which as I said, have no uh, charge. 
So you can combine a different number of uh, neutrons for a fixed number of protons. And if you do that, you have basically a different number overall of nucleons inside the nucleus and, of course, inside the atom. So in that case, you still have the same chemical element, for example, carbon with six and six, six protons, six neutrons. If I add one extra neutron, then I go to carbon, but now we have an isotope of carbon 13 because I have added uh, seven neutrons. And if I make one more, then I go to carbon 14. This is one of the most typical examples we, we use because uh, carbon 14 is radioactive, as we call it, and it's used for radiochronology and just getting lifetimes out of, um, uh, of these different systems that contain uh, carbon and this, uh, everything we call here, we call them radioisotopes or isotopes in general. So the isotopes are a central, uh, basically meaning, a central um, term in uh, the whole nuclear physics and the whole atomic physics because it defines not the chemical character, but the nuclear, the stable and unstable, as I could say, character of um, the chemical elements. They play a crucial role in the whole evolution of the universe. And uh, this fundamental property we call it instability. Isotopes can be basically um, stable, but if you change the number of neutrons, you can cause some instability. And this is, of course, due to the extra interactions, the fundamental interactions that are hidden inside the, the nucleus that can drive the energy of the system to different levels and they can cause instability. And this instability, basically we interpret it and we can see it experimentally uh, as a decay or as a transmutation if we would like to be a little more careful with that. Transmutation basically says that I can have an initial isotope at, at some point of time, this completely uh, out of the blue without any cause can transmute itself uh, to something else. Of course, this is not magic. It is the exact effect of the competition of all the fundamental nuclear forces that exist inside the nucleus that cause an energy imbalance. And this energy imbalance due to entropy or to other um, explanations that are co completely equivalent, of course, one can really um, uh, get a different species, just get a new atom, a new chemical, a new chemical element, or even a new isotopes, which is actually um, uh, maybe the, the best term to use at this, uh, at this uh, lingo we use. So this energy balance between the initial and the, um, the last stage, the final stage is usually associated with some um, emittance of radiation. So you basically, you have an extra energy, extra energy that you can really get rid of. And this is done with radiation. Now, radiation here, this context, of course, we can, we can say is something like a representation of energy emitted or basically becoming available to the environment. However, sometimes it's, um, it has a, a very different representation uh, as particles or uh, photons or basically light that's emitted out of this uh, unstable nu uh, nuclei. If you look at um, the situation, as you know today in, in nature, and you look at all the isotopes known, uh, starting from the periodic table of Mendeleev, one can really see that uh, each element, most of the elements, all of the elements, have isotopes, first of all, more than one isotope. But most of the naturally occurring uh, isotopes basically um, uh, have a different percentage, let's say, different abundance, which is, is, is uh, the most correct one, is the most correct term is to use, a, a different abundance uh, for a specific chemical element. So you can see different colors that actually here represent uh, different percentages for one uh, specific isotope, uh, the stable or the long-lived. Of course, there are many, many more, as I will show you in the next slide, that actually are completely unstable. They live very, 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 very short times and lives and they have nothing to do with the most stable or long-lived um, partners, cousins in this series of isotopes. So this is the situation, as you know, you can see, for example, that you start from uh, uh, hydrogen here, one, and you go to helium, but um, you can climb this stair all the way up to 92 number of protons down here in uranium, and from that point on, everything is basically artificial. There is no stable... Um, there's no stable uh, or long-lived isotope for uh, Z equals 93 on. Everything is man-made. We made them, actually, we made them in a, in a laboratory. Uh, in nature, the critical point is bismuth 83. Basically, this is the last of the atomic, I would say, stable isotope, uh, a chem a chemical element that a stable uh, isotope can exist. Um, the others, as I said, for example, thorium, protactinium, uranium, are very long-lived, not stable completely, but they have something like billions of years of lifetime, 
uh, so they can consider it at least for the lifetime of the Earth and the terrestrial environment uh, more or less uh, stable. Um, by looking at the situation as it's formed today, uh, here we have a nuclear landscape. Basically, we have all these isotopes distributed um, in an XY diagram here. Uh, the horizontal axis is neutrons, the perpendicular, the vertical one is protons, and you can see a whole distribution of isotopes. Every single square there in a dot represents one single isotope in this, uh, in this uh, thing, and the color code basically has to do with how short-lived or how long-lived these, these isotopes are. You can see, for example, that near the center of, um, of this plot, this dark uh, blue and, of course, the black ones have very long lifetimes that are either stable or uh, basically uh, long-lived. And they actually exist already from the beginning of the solar cell, uh, solar system here um, in, um, uh, in, uh, in Earth when they started uh, basically having uh, uh, all the planets being formed uh, after some kind of a cosmic event happened and formed this uh, uh, this neighborhood. So the nuclear landscape is uh, is a very important uh, thing because it's it's our map to really get the information about isotopes. We know several things about isotopes, especially the stable ones and uh, the long lived, but we know very few things about the exotic ones that are, reside exactly at the um, at the sites at the drip, near the drip lines, as we call it, where the stability basically uh, results in completely unbound, completely unstable systems. So I mentioned already about radiation, but here we have to uh, to think about radioactivity. So in terms of radioactivity, one has to really understand what exactly it is. It's a term that it's not very well defined in in uh, in sense because sometimes it gets mixed with radiation. However, radioactivity is is a property. Is, as spontaneous transformation of a nucleus to another species. And then this transmutation, this transformation, as I said uh, earlier, usually is accompanied by some emitted radiation. It can be charged particles, it can be light or heavy particles, it can also be photons like uh, gamma or X-rays, uh, it can be several things. And here in nucleus, what we really um, have to understand is how radioactivity um, uh, really takes place. What is the reason behind? We try to understand the nuclear uh, potential, the nuclear dynamics uh, that causes this instability and results in these transmutations. These are all spontaneous changes. You can also have triggered radioactivity. If you have, for example, nuclear reactions, we have dynamic systems, collisions in some cosmic environment or even a nuclear lab here on Earth. But uh, what we care basically, radioactivity, we call it as a spontaneous transformation. This spontaneous thing is really important to understand uh, also things in the marine environment, but also in terrestrial. Um, we already uh, said that uh, with all the elements with Z uh, higher than 83 are radioactive, uh, and some of them have been made only in the lab. What are the most common or the dominant um, ways of getting the radioactivity? How can we measure it? How can I identify it? How can we really study it? We take basically information from radiation. Radiation carries, as I said, this energy that has been released due to the transformation. So you can either have it as an alpha particle, which is basically a nucleus um, uh, of helium, two protons and two neutrons. They have a binding energy, so they need some kind of uh, glue, let's say, uh, to really keep them together, but also have kinetic energy, which really uh, uh, mo makes this um, particle move away as uh, the transmutation or after the transmutation occurs. You can also have beta particles. Beta particles basically are electrons, but one has to be careful because these are not electrons that exist in the atomic orbits. These are electrons that are created inside the nucleus when a proton becomes a neutron spontaneously or the, the other way around, a neutron becomes a proton. So you can either have electrons or positrons, minus negative electrons or positive uh, plus electrons, um, together with uh, those uh, elusive particles we call the neutrinos that I'm, gonna go, I'm not going to cover at all today. These are the two uh, modes, most common modes. We have charged particles being emitted, alpha, nuclei of helium, and beta, basically electrons or positrons. There's another thing that we call disintegration, essentially, decay. There you don't have basically a transmutation of the chemical element. Typically, you have to have an excited nucleus at the beginning, which will de-excite, so it will lose some of the energy that has, um, uh, has uh, abandoned, and this energy is being transformed into a pure quantum mechanical wave, a pure photon that is emitted. So basically we're talking about gamma rays, photons, that actually have all the properties of an electromagnetic wave, but they have a much higher frequency because they have, carry a much higher energy um, with respect to other types of electromagnetic 
um, uh, radiation. For example, here, here we can have, uh, we can have the, the full spectrum of um, uh, photons, uh, electromagnetic radiation starting from uh, very uh, large uh, uh, wavelengths or small frequencies on the left side, starting from radio, microwave, and gamma rays basically reside on the far right of this uh, picture where you have very high energy, very high um, uh, frequency, uh, but also very tiny uh, wavelengths. This correlation or the relation, not the correlation, this relation and the comparison of the wavelength with the dimensions of a system that we'd like to study has important implications when we try to see this as subatomic world. If you, one has to go deeper in matter and try to identify the, um, uh, the particles or the systems that reside, you need more and more higher energy, so you need smaller and smaller dimensions to really uh, reach those um, objects that uh, are hidden inside the, the atom. Radiation, of course, um, and this is something that is more or less uh, commonly known also to the general public, can come as a non-ionizing or ionizing radiation. What basically this means is that uh, it's the potential of radiation to really cause the ionization of an atom, basically kick out an electron. So you take a neutral atom, you uh, impinge some radiation, and then if some of the electrons, one or two or more, electrons uh, leave the, the atom, just go out of their orbit, then you have a positively uh, charged ion. So basically, um, uh, the atom is ionized. This is important because by the time you have an ion in a large body, it can be in uh, um, a geological horizon, it can be in a DNA, in a cell, or someplace in the universe, you immediately have some kind of uh, electric field that can be, be, be responsible for chemical interactions or other interactions due to this um, occurrence. So ionizing radiation has important implications also for um, uh, the dose delivered and also the impact that we uh, can have also on life. And for the marine environment, this impact can be significant. It's one of the things that one try, tries to understand to get the proper data out to really understand how this ionization occurs in the marine environment how it really affects biota, biosystems, microbes, uh, whatever exists in this marine environment near, for example, sources of radiation uh, that exist in, um, near the seabed or in other uh, loci uh, that um, one can really study in the marine and the water volume. So if you have living organisms, this dose from radiation is important. And uh, to the moment, this is a highly intensive um, uh, field of research, especially to understand all this marine biology and how it's affected by radiation in a bad also, which is uh, more or less what we care, but also sometimes in a good way, as I will explain later on. Ionizing, ionizing radiation, we know that it may, and I really stress this word, may have an impact, a bad impact on DNA, causing DNA damage, or if it's a little more um, uh, impactful, it can be cellular decay or even death. But in overall, what we see is, and I will explain later on, is that we don't really have uh, basically uh, high, high doses, except um, in a very uh, specific situation. This is common also, not in the marine environment, but everywhere. The universe is basically a bath of radiation. Here, as we talk, as I speak, and you're listening here in this webinar, everybody is affected by radiation that is around us in the natural environment from sources that we don't see, we don't understand because it's something that is completely invisible. So the natural ecosystems basically have significant quantities of radioactive isotopes. They emit radiation continuously. Us as human beings are basically um, uh, uh, the receivers of this uh, uh, radioactivity with this radiation. And uh, of course, if you have uh, lots and lots of radiation, then one has to really estimate what the dose is and if this has some biological uh, impact uh, on our health or other uh, effects. The natural occurring radioactive materials, we call them NORM as an abbreviation, exist already from day one of the solar systems. Uh, we don't know exactly how the solar system has been formed. We have some theories and some models. Uh, basically, nucleosynthesis is uh, the very first uh, um, uh, reaction that really um, caused the, the creation of these heavy elements up to uh, uranium. So this nucleosynthetic processes is basically a huge, a vast network actually of reactions that really populate all the chemical elements we know today. And some of them, this norm, this natural radioactivity has shaped Earth in ways we cannot even imagine. I will give you two examples. Is, uh, for example, our human evolution 
how, for example, uh, all the mammals and humans uh, included uh, have evolved to have skin, which is really something that has a very good um, a response to radiation uh, and protects the inner organs, or even in a, a monogeological, monogeological aspects, one can really uh, understand how the, um, the Earth is shielded by cosmic radiation that comes from outer space due to the magnetic field, which is ba basically induced by a, sed uh, a ferromagnetic um, uh, Earth core, which has basically a rotation due to exactly the heat of the uranium and thorium that exists in the center of the Earth. So this, this heat really puts all this um, um, inside the core into motion, into some rotation. And this rotation, because you have uh, uh, iron and nickel isotopes, which are magnetic, ferromagnetic, you create basically something like a rotor, which has a magnetic field. And this magnetic field acts like a protection shield against cosmic radiation, which will otherwise uh, have a significant impact and maybe uh, destroy Earth. This is one of very important. Uh, this is just two examples of how radioactivity affects the uh, the overall environment here on, on the Earth. So, a lot of people might ask, "Okay, this is all okay, but radioactivity, radiation is dangerous." There is no clear answer. This has to uh, basically uh, always uh, evaluated, assessed with respect to the dose. And uh, I can give you a very uh, fine example that I also give my students from time to time. If you have a banana for breakfast, for example, you get a tiny, tiny dose that is basically uh, because of the content of uh, potassium-40, which is a naturally occurring radioactive isotopes that exists in food, not only bananas, but in other nuts. Um, there are many examples of radioactive substances that exist in our food. With them, our own bodies are basically slightly tiny, of course, uh, quantities, uh, slightly radioactive because of the food, because of our uh, living inside um, a very dynamic uh, environment which has several components and we are also affected and we are part of this, uh, of this ecosystem. So uh, evolution really has shaped our organism to withstand tiny or small doses of radioactivity on a daily life. And uh, this is, for example, um, uh, decay mode of this potassium-40, one of the isotopes that is very common in the natural occurring uh, uh, cases we, we study. Um, potassium-40 can either decay or transmute to, uh, to uh, potassium-40 or to argon-40, to, I'm sorry, to calcium-40 or to argon-40. And uh, it has very definite modes of uh, decay. For example, you can go by beta decay or it can go by electron capture or even give also gamma radiation in the process, for example, this 1460, actually it's 1461 exactly, KV, uh, which is um, a very characteristic gamma ray that's emitted when uh, potassium-40 uh, decays in the banana, in the Brazilian nuts, or in any other things like the fertilizers that we put, uh, for example, in our fields uh, to grow some cords. Uh, the, one of the problems is that when you have uh, um, some radioactive isotopes that uh, transforms itself, you don't know when or how exactly it's going to go from one point to the other or which of the decay modes will basically prefer. However, with all the experiments and measurements over the years, most of these isotopes, especially the norm, we understand in terms of the probability of decaying with one or the other way. And this is very well fixed. We understand um, the statistics. Uh, we'll come back to statistics later on. So we understand how this uh, transformation can happen. And by really um, focusing on this transformation, if we study this transformation, we can get the information also in a more general picture when you uh, have these isotopes in a larger uh, ecosystem in the marine environment or, or uh, elsewhere. So we can follow these modes and we can take advantage of it to understand also dynamics that reflect on a larger system. And uh, of course, if somebody would like to understand how much dose you get from this, uh, th these things, how can you be affected as a human being or as an ecosystem? This is just a typical example that uh, actually was published, uh, uh, I think, last week. Um, here we use this um, uh, not so common, let's say, uh, to non-experts unit called Z Sievert, which is basically a, a dose energy deposited on a specific organ and uh, by taking into account also the biological effects of a particular radiation. So as you can see that on a daily, uh, on a daily activity, if you look at... Uh, how natural radiation really affects us. You can see, for example, you take something like 22,000, uh, 2,400 uh, we'll say per year. This is a typical thing that comes from uh, the Earth as a terrestrial environment. The food that we consume from outer, from outer space with cosmic radiation that 
hits uh, on us and uh, causes some potentially causes some biological effects. But also one important thing is radon that we inhale and comes from uh, as a radioactive uh, decay product from uh, some naturally occurring series that we will cover later on. So you can see, for example, if you live near a nuclear plant or if you take a, an X-ray for your chest or even taking a CT scan, you have different amounts uh, of those uh, per year at least that uh, are there. And of course, one has to really understand what the limits should be on uh, these activities, how it can affect your life if something is dangerous. Um, just pay pay attention that this scale basically is not linear, but it's logarithmic and climbs up orders of magnitude um, and not uh, quite um, uh, analogous, proportional to uh, to every step you have here. So um, it's important to understand all this and uh, uh, periodically all the international communities, especially those uh, that deal with this uh, impact on human life, but also on uh, ecosystems, really update the information based on data, based on measurements. And to that extent also Ramon is very related, very relevant with what uh, we aim to offer to the international community in terms of uh, radioactivity fields that we find in the marine environment, but also impact on ecosystems, but also human populations uh, that live near coast and have uh, daily activities, for example, like fishing or swimming or whatever. So um, the marine environment, does, that aspect is rather unexplored, completely unexplored, I would say, I dare to say, but um, we have to really find this gap and close it by monitoring and providing reliable measurements. If somebody looks at the, the origin of chemical elements, how they produced, just a little slide, you can see that um, all this terrestrial radiation, also in the marine environment, come from some very intense, very um, dramatic and exotic events like Big Bang fusion or uh, merging neutron stars, or basically uh, all kinds of cosmogenic um, uh, processes that drive uh, the creation of, this, um, of these elements and the numbers of these elements, of course. And you can see that what we deal basically up to here, uranium or plutonium uh, 94, uh, is basically some um, uh, elements that we take from merging neutron stars that exist in some uh, neighborhood. It existed sometime in the past, several billion years before the creation of Earth and really spewed out all this uh, matter that eventually formed the planets and the solar system. All these remnants of the merging neutron stars or some uh, other processes, basically we see on the Earth, we can find them in the depths of the ocean. We can even find today, for example, traces of this cosmogenic, uh, for example, supernova explosions that happened several billion years uh, before that uh, uh, we can find them, for example, the sediments down in the Indian Ocean or elsewhere. What can we see? What can we measure? What can we focus in, uh, uh, on Earth? We can focus on three, basically, series. We have another one, but it has exhausted itself due to very short lifetimes. We have three naturally occurring series, decay series, as we call them, uranium-238, thorium-232, and uranium-235. These are all naturally occurring long-lived isotopes. They have billions of years lifetime, which means they're basically almost stable. Um, compared, for example, this 4.5 billion years of half-life that uranium-232 has as a nucleus with uh, the pretty similar um, age of the Earth as it's uh, calculated, as estimated by independent measurements today. So these long-lived isotopes, the mothers as we call them, really generate sorry, a series of other isotopes that can also be um, important because they are also radioactive with different, with a variety of lifetimes, uh, with a variety of uh, also uh, masses and uh, decays modes. But you can see that you have basically a constant production of all these isotopes, different completely isotopes that are uh, basically a product of transmutation of one initial uh, mother nucleus that exists in the natural environment. So you can track basically information that is related to these isotopes that are created, the daughters or the granddaughters, and get information also from the very, very, very early nucleus or just follow the dynamics of these um, ions, basically, that carry those radioactive nuclei that um, circulated in the environment. Uh, they also have chemical reactions. They have uh, all kinds of geological settings, entrapment, scavenging, we'll see uh, immediately after. Uh, so we have a very well uh, understood tool with some of the properties already known from independent measurements that one can really focus on to understand what happens in the environment, in our case, in the marine environment. 
one of the not the problems, but one of the characteristic um, things that one have to keep in mind when you study this kind of processes is that when you have radioactive decays, especially in this decay series, you have a probabilistic process. So it's a completely stochastic, as we call it in uh, mathematics. So this probabilistic is basically uh, something that we have to uh, uh, to understand as that a nucleus has some tiny fraction of probability to decay at some specific point of time, but you cannot really predict at what time or how many of those at this time will uh, basically decay. So you typically study a full ensemble, a full set of nuclei, and you see how they behave as time goes by. So you understand the dynamics, you understand the energy released, also you understand how these um, numbers of the initial ensemble changes um, as time goes. One important parameter, or let's say um, quantity, uh, is basically what we call the decay constant lambda, that it really comes from the Poisson probability distribution, it's a mathematical expression, mathematical distribution. Uh, there's a nice story behind it. Um, but uh, the, it describes generally very exotic, very rare events. And it's an approximation. If you take a lambda goes to, uh, to zero, this um, uh, typically goes, um, can, can be simulated with a Gaussian. So starting from this Poisson probability, one can really uh, uh, put some statistics in the game and see, for example, an initial set of um, um, uh, of a nuclei, how it involves. You can have a very nice exponential decay starting from the 100%, 1.0 there. You can see that it evolves with an exponential curve. So we have a decay. Some of the nuclei will decay eventually and it has half-life that's really involved in the process, basically meaning that after this half-life, 50% of the initial quantity has left. After two half-lives, uh, you have basically 25%, uh, 12.5% and so on until the whole population really reaches five, six half-lives and really goes down to less than 3% of the initial calculation where we consider that it's almost dead or nearly gone. So the connection uh, between this statistical macroscopic picture and the actual quantum dynamics that really influence and trigger this, uh, this evolution is this lambda. And lambda is the decay constant, as you said, but it also carries the information from the quantum mechanic levels from the microscopic level to the large scales. Um, a Nobel Prize in 1903 was uh, basically what uh, Rutherford predicted with this uh, evolution of the initial ensemble, the number of nuclei that decay. So the rate of decay, basically, is D neo BBP, is uh, proportional to the number of nuclei existing. So you define basically lambda times n, n is the amount of nuclei existing as the activity, and we measure it in becquerels, which means one decay per second, or curies, which are much larger. Uh, unit is 3.7, 10 to the 10th uh, disintegrations per, per second. If you solve that with some initial, very simple initial um, uh, conditions, then you can get the famous exponential decay law, which is similar also for other systems, for example, biological systems. And from that, this lambda and t, you can get only uh, three relations between lambda, the half-life, tough, uh, tough one half, and the uh, mean lifetime of the system, which is basically an average life of decay, this uh, tau, the Greek tau, as we call it, which is the mean lifetime of the system. All three are basically equivalent and they are bound by these three relations. So you can use them independently according to what we need. So we have uh, an evolution, an, an initial daughter, an initial mother that can decay with some uh, L1 and has some initial parameter that can also be, for example, in the marine environment with some initial location you found in some uh, hotspot, for example, or some hydrothermal vent field. Then you can study the decay by a set of linear um, differential equations, basically we call them Batman equations, uh, when we try to really have this uh, linear approach and uh, generalize it with a much more complex system. But with this three-step um, decay, lambda n, lambda d, or two, two different uh, decays, mother, daughter, granddaughter, you can have a set like this. And from that set, depending on what lambda one and lambda two is, uh, you get four different uh, relations for the half-life set. Essentially, what is the relations of the the lifetimes of the mother, daughter, or the mother, granddaughter, and you can get what we call equilibrium eventually. I'm not going to stay uh, too much on that because it's also a little mathematical. I'm just going to show the evolution of the system depending on the four cases, if the mother is long-lived or if the daughter is uh, long-lived, uh, if the mother is nearly the same with the daughter uh, in life uh, or the, the other way around. So you can get what we call equilibrium, which means that uh, equilibrium, basically, the mother with the daughter have a direct relationship between the popu their populations. So the way the mother evolves in time um, 
proportionally the daughter um, also follows with its population and uh, number of nuclei that exist. So this is very important also because if you would like to have a, a very complex system with uh, many components, for example, like an ocean ecosystem, this um, isotopes, these isotopes basically can really give you um, uh, information regarding on the condition that the equilibrium is there or not. For example, if you don't have an equilibrium or you're missing an equilibrium, you get important information about um, the dynamics of the ecosystem. The reason is that all these things, of course, decay uh, at the nuclear level, but you never forget that the nucleus is inside an atom, and then as an atom also has chemical properties. And if you're in a very dynamic, very complex ecosystem where you have chemical reaction, you have biological accumulation, or any other things that exist, really the chemical imbalance or the chemical uh, reactions can alter this equilibrium by bounding one system uh, to some component or by releasing to other component and so on. So this fully dynamic system um, is, is, a, is an issue and we really have to understand it. More, more than that, we have to understand that oceans, which has a vast resource in many aspects, biotechnology, uh, I don't know, mineralization, uh, exploitation in many other things, but also preservation of, uh, of life, uh, sustainability, we try really not to get uh, really too much damage on it, uh, but also it's a huge healthy system for the planet and the giant ecosystem has some problems that we have to also to understand and perhaps radioactivity in the marine environment can be a real uh, attacking approach to get, for example, information about pollution, about microplastics, uh, kinetics, about ocean acidification since uh, the climate change is really affected by this acidification in uh, the marine environment. Um, but also you have exotic events that really uh, give input or give, um, um, let's say, more stuff in a more popular way um, due to natural hazards or man-made hazards. For example, if you go to some exotic uh, location, geolocation, like in the case of hydrothermal vent fields, you can see, for example, um, matter that comes from inside the, the mantle or comes from uh, the subsea phase, uh, the subsurface. Uh, you can get uh, lots of gases, for example, uh, carbon dioxide or methane, but in the process, Radioactive traces are also there and are really carried out, for example, uh, radon, by this uh, kind of uh, motion. This can be really um, uh, a, a case study for, um, uh, for radioactivity to use it as a, as, a, as a tracer. Or you can have really dynamic events like submarine explosions. This is a natural hazard. Uh, this happened in January and uh, um, basically devastated the whole area. Um, we can have, uh, however, in our neighbor here in Greece, we have uh, also very dynamic, very uh, active systems like the, the Columbo volcano in Santorini. Here you can see, for example, a bathymetric map um, that shows the cone, the crater of, the, of Columbo with some other volcanic cones uh, on the northeast part. And in the center of this, just down by 500 meters uh, depth, you can see very intense hydrothermal vent fields like this champagne uh, style um, edifice that really gets uh, bubbles out, carbon dioxide. Uh, also potentially carrying radioactive melvets from inside the, the subsurface. Um, this uh, volcanic uh, cone, of course, has a very, uh, very uh, many components one has to study. Uh, I'm not a geologist, but uh, Ramon has the experts to really carry this type of research. I'm just showing here, um, recently published a few years, a couple of years back, um, in collaboration with the University of Oregon, uh, how this um, uh, a magma chamber underneath the, uh, the Columbo volcano is really shaped uh, based on measurements that were basically very detailed and very thorough. But uh, besides these natural hazards and these natural laboratories you may have in our neighborhood, one also has to take uh, care of also man-made activities. Here, just give a, um, a, a, a little example of how drilling, oil drilling or natural gas drilling um, occurs at the depths of the ocean, where you basically really go with um, evasive uh, ways and try to get into the, the subground. Uh, the problem is that uh, with this kind of process, you also get something in the environment which is not necessarily good uh, and can have an impact, not only chemically or potentially toxic elements, but also radioactivity that exists inside the mantle. And now you just uh, uh, force it to carry out uh, through these uh, pipelines that you uh, uh, you try to install uh, via the, um, the drilling um, that you do. So th this kind of things really affect this human activities affect um, uh, the radioactivity content. It can cause imbalance in a rather, uh, as we would like to think at least, uh, balanced system. Um, but um, I hope I, I gave you a couple of examples. I will give you a few more. 
uh, the way you understand today the source of marine radioactivity is basically on the on this uh, concept of the uranium thorium series. We know that these are primordial primordial origin, nucleosynthetic, some cosmogenic maybe. We have them as norm in land and sea, and we also have through through their decay a long uh, series of other radioactive daughters that are also important for the marine environment. For example, radium two twenty six, uh, its daughter radon radon two twenty two. Uh, or even a granddaughter, bismuth 214, etc. You can also have cosmogenic radionuclides that have been deposited in the marine environment, basically due to the continuous cosmic radiation bombardment that comes from uh, outer space, interacts with the atmosphere, with all the chemical elements, oxygen and nitrogen, etc., and uh, hydrogen, and can create, for example, tritium or carbon 14, beryllium 7. And um, when you have, for example, uh, um, events like uh, rain that really deposits uh, uh, lots of water from the atmosphere to the interface. These are also important to study because they can be traces for this kind of activity um, in the marine uh, in the marine environment. Also, one important parameter is the anthropogenic radionuclides. Basically, the first time we introduced them was in 1944 uh, uh, due to the nuclear tests uh, that happened uh, in the World War Second World War, and on and continuously after we have more than a thousand uh, nuclear tests in the marine environment. Um, but also due to some releases, controlled releases from nuclear power plants or um, uh, disasters like uh, the Fukushima disaster after the, uh, the tsunami uh, had an impact on the nuclear power plant in Fukushima and uh, uh, in Japan. Uh, and from there, you get from this kind of events, typically you get man made, artificially produced uh, radionuclides. Uh, most common and most significant are, for example, uh, tritium again, or cesium 137, strontium 90, which I didn't put here, um, some plutonium isotopes 238, 239, 240, and uh, several more like iodine and uh, gallium and uh, ruthenium and so on. So these are all important components. You can see both natural but also anthropogenic radionuclides. These are important. They exist in the marine environment. They influence the components. It can be down in the sediments. It can be the water volume. It can be the interface. It can be trapped. It can decay. It can populate more. Uh, so there's all of them dynamically exchanged or basically become also uh, in more closed systems in equilibrium with each other. This is really important. And one can really uh, um, actually rely on the fact that in some cases there's a fixed number. So there's equilibrium, for example, sediments that if you find it disturbed, if you find something is really not as you not as, as you do as you expect it, then you have some kind of a, a natural process or a, a man-made process that really affects the concentration and the activity. And this can trigger really the study and understand, of course, of dynamic phenomena that might occur. As for example, in the case of the natural hazards with the submarine volcanoes I showed you before. So if you would like to go to the marine environment and study radioactivity, there are two things, two lines of attack. First, you can focus on radioactivity itself, just measure it. It's completely unexplored, or at least it's, uh, uh, let's make it a little smoother, it's largely unexplored. So we don't know much about radioactivity in the oceans. The second is that you can use radioactivity and trace our elements as a proxy. So you can basically study other processes, geological, oceanographic, environmental, atmospheric, cosmogenic, just by studying the radioactive um, content in the water column, in the sediments, or all the components uh, one has in the marine environment. And these are just examples by other researchers, not ours. Um, four different processes are mostly the, the most important ones. You have scavenging, you have LC gas exchange, you have tracing groundwater exchange, sedimentation, uh, edge determination also is very important for sediments uh, or for other, for example, uh, ground uh, groundwater uh, discharges that one can really study and also have some connection between the land and um, uh, marine environments. These are all important. There are some techniques. The state of the art is basically take samples, just go to the lab, analyze the content, uh, be very careful uh, with the system, validate your uh, equipment at the lab, uh, basically carry everything from far away in the middle of the ocean to some lab, uh, continental lab, and measure, make the measurement. The problem is that you don't have many solutions. Basically, you don't have any solutions um, that can really cover a large water body in the marine environment with in situ autonomously uh, system. In this system, you have some traces that, as I said, it's radium iberales. These are the isotopes of uh, ra radium. They decay to radon or foron, and one can really rely on them, both as traces, but also as radioactivity itself, where you have to measure it. Either because they um, they have a very chem very characteristic chemical behavior. In salt water, radium becomes uh, mobile, so it moves around. While you have fresh water, where the salt is really uh, low, 
then it absorbs two particles like uh, becomes um, basically bound with some kind of water balloons as I call them uh, but you can also have uh, high concentration of radium and salt in submarine groundwater but also very low concentrations in ocean water so any imbalance any difference in the ratios that you expect from one component to the other can really trigger um, the study that something is there a process something influenced moreover this radium dotage radium emanation for example uh, from some seismic faults has been established as a precursor of site of earthquakes already from 1971 where you can see basically radon emanation here follows the seismic activity very nicely and you have um, a precursor signal that one can really exploit if you have the proper means and um, you continuously monitor the seismic fault and it's not so easy especially in the marine environment you can get some uh, some uh, correlation between how much radon and when it's emitted with when the um, the, the earthquake occurs. This, of course, has been ver verified by many other researchers in continental. Um, um, there were some uh, unreliable measurements at the beginning, but uh, ever since 2007, I would say, and later on 2015, uh, now you have very reliable indices that one can really uh, study measuring radon on thoron. Uh, and uh, basically having a correlation with the seismic activity in a region uh, as a precursor, which means that we have some time to really get information, understand that an earthquake is about to occur, and perhaps um, uh, inform the public, inform the authorities to take precautions against an upcoming earthquake. But is it so in the marine environment? Nobody knows. Is it affected by some kind of uh, local conditions in the marine environment? Nobody knows. So we have really a very handy thing, a very uh, good motivation to really go and look for it. Also, you have releases to the ocean. Here is a model by NOAA uh, for Fukushima, the way the cesium, basically all the, uh, the plume in the uh, uh, Pacific Ocean occurred after the disaster in Fukushima. But also here on the right side, you have some photographs from 3,500 meters uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, where basically you have some nuclear waste barrels uh, deposited there. Here is from 70, 78, this is from 78, this is from 84. Um, these are waste barrels basically from nuclear power plants operation all the residue or the spent fuel uh, is, is put inside these barrels and dumped in the sea um, where the protective layer of the ocean is uh, <clears throat> quite significant but if you would like to study all of this if you would like to really get in, uh, your hands on, um, on on the information either as a direct measurement or as a proxy measurement of radioactivity there are some limitations by the nature of the oceans and this is basically, we understand it all, it's because of the remoteness and the harshness of the environment. The oceans are vast, basically it's 75% of, uh, of the whole uh, surface. But if you'd like to really roam with some kind of instrument, you have, need power autonomy. You need to understand how your vessels, your instruments will operate in these harsh conditions, basically um, to very remote areas, to large depths. Also, if you'd like to get some uh, hands-on radioactivity, you have to understand that the physical situation behind the physics behind it also presents some limitation. When you have, for example, a protective, as we call it, layer of water, you have radiation let, which is not kilometers, it's in the range of meters. And of course, we don't know the oceans themselves. If you'd like to go to remote areas, you have to get information first, how the ocean seabed is, what the colder with column is, what the edifices might be, what kind of bathymetry you have as information. These are all important information before you try to get the information for radioactivity or other measurements. So today we have roughly 25% of the oceans known and compare that to 100% of the Mars surface we know. So basically we're non-explored and completely unexplored. We need to really put some emphasis on that. So you also need innovative approaches for all the other ones. So if you'd like to go into the water column above the seabed, about uh, dynamic, exotic um, events like a submarine volcano, which is about to explode, you have to have the proper tools, the proper techniques, the proper methodologies, algorithms. Now you have to rely on artificial intelligence, machine learning techniques. You really have to be smart on how to attack, how to approach and how to attack the problem. And um, as a motivation wrap up for what Ramones is about, especially in terms of radioactivity, is basically that we know today that radioactivity in the marine environment is completely undersampled, is unmeasured, is understudied. There are limitations, um, and the kind of instrumentation cannot really operate for long terms, cannot really uh, access everything. They are not mobile. Most of them are boys, static um, uh, instruments. Um, and uh, in the most cases, actually, they also have medium or um, uh, low resolution, which is needed 
in terms of um, uh, the, the good, the, the reliable information we get for various isotopes that exist in the marine environment. So in general, and this is also underlined by all the international organizations, the United Nations, the IAEA, um, uh, the European uh, Marine Waters uh, Initiatives, um, there is a global demand to close this gap in monitoring in the marine environment. This is, this is really important. It's our planet, it's our processes, it's our environment. We need to really understand it because also this massive ocean volume is a protective shield, a protective layer for the human population. For radioactivity, even if this is man-made, uh, man artificial, or if it's in the water, uh, that, uh, the water that contains radioactivity due to natural uh, sources. Uh, so for the ocean ecosystems, we don't know anything. We don't know, really don't know anything. So um, in most cases, it's difficult. That's why it's widely ignored. But in, in, uh, we have to really pay attention also um, uh, for, uh, for biota, for uh, bacterial mats, uh, mats that live uh, near, the, um, near the vents and so on. Uh, also, I have to stress this one. You have nuclear accidents, potential nuclear accidents. You have drilling sites. These are more intense actually activities. For example, natural gas or oil drilling platforms. You have earthquakes. These are all uh nice nice um, they're all very interesting i would say uh um, objectives that one has really to focus to get the information out using radioactivity as a tracer or as a direct so what is our approach and for, sorry for taking a little more time than expected ramon says to really invest on detectors on robotics and really bring an innovative approach even this is called a, a novel set of detectors a novel set of um, uh, underwater vehicles, a novel set of algorithms, uh, rely on artificial intelligence and machine learning and get information out that can be useful for the public, understand the risks, uh, transmit and inform the public, the public and the governments about the risk of a potential event of, or even just for routine monitoring uh, a potentially interesting site. These are all important objectives in Ramon's, which uh, stands for radioactivity monitoring in ocean ecosystems. Um, I'm not going to deal with that. We really rely for the first time to get uh, something going, design, develop and validate a broad set of novel instruments for measuring radioactivity, offer high resolution, operate uh, autonomously in synergy, we can have self-adaptation, uh, self-deployment, sorry, uh, self-awareness of our systems it can be collaborative. So this means you need advanced robotic capabilities, you need new algorithms for uh, intercommunication and interdecision. You need a lot of things that have to be designed from scratch um, based on um, the, the demand that we have at hand. And of course, from this, you can also get all the results out that can be useful to get multimodal data, uh, harmonize the data sets, provide information and get uh, information out, out that can be useful for policy shaping, uh, for communities, for governments, for local authorities. Um, we have uh, several, uh, we have several um, ambitions, uh, but in the process of creating all of these instruments, Ramon has um, a, a concept that can be more or less summarized with this one. And um, you can have, for example, gliders, wave gliders that uh, roam the, the water volume carry uh, novel instrumentation like uh, CZT gamma sniffers, so you call them, or you can have a bathing lab that will carry a set of instruments, uh, cameras for hotspot hot, hot detection, uh, Cerenko radiation detectors uh, as a prototype, alpha in situ alpha spectrometry um, that we have to build, um, and also intercommunication, as I said, adaptation of the path to, to study potentially interesting effects. Either can be man-made, like for example, a potential uh, hotspot of where radioactive waste has been dumped some time ago, or a natural hazard like a hydrotherm, an active hydrothermal vent field that we know that comes uh, is associated with radon emanation as the gases outflow from the from the internal. So we are in the process of building novel radiation sensors, um, couple them with marine robotics on these gliders. We have assistive artificial intelligence that really drives all these uh, operations. And also we, we try to get a focus uh, on the practical side, not only radioactivity, as you said, but also on the environment itself and the geosciences, understand uh, large dynamic processes, geological settings uh, that are active in the neighborhood near human population, dense human populations and communities. And also uh, to that end, really get a risk forecasting and shape policies that can be useful and meaningful and practical for the communities that have this kind of natural or man-made hazards in the neighborhood. And of course, this is a high risk, high gain project because that's why it's a FET. Uh, so we have several prototypes that need to be built, understood, validated also in the field. And everything in the end should be basically um, follow the FAIR uh, policies for um, uh, findable, accessible, et cetera for the data, but also open access so we can help the communities and the, 
uh, and the and the and the uh, sorry and the authorities and the scientific community as well to to get the information out. So, with all this, this is just a set of the things. For example, gamma sniffer, Gaspar, and Sugi. These are gamma radiation detectors, aspect and cellular amount of the particle site. Wave gliders are our vehicles for the marine environment. We have several new algorithms that need to be built for the cooperation and the self awareness and self adaptive. Um, uh, um, uh, pathways, and we need to have that driven decision making for what to do, what to check, and uh, what to estimate. Uh, all these need simulations and modeling also for the dosimetry uh, in the uh, marine ecosystem. Uh, we have to really run field tests. We've started already having field tests, and we're building the first risk information system that can really couple to uh, fair data and open access data to inform. This is just example of a um, uh, series of a gamma sniffer, which uh, has been modeled and has been already tested for some kind of um, <clears throat> measurements for uh, uh, getting the proper information out uh, with some kind of scenario. We have several scenarios to test and validate the detectors before deploy them in the actual instrument. Here's, for example, the prototype. You can see here the, the little detector that is inside in a hermetically closed um, uh, 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 housing. And here's uh, somewhere in one meter uh, depth, for example, you can see it in a, in a recent test where you can uh, test with the real sources. Uh, we couple everything with simulation to understand also um, uh, and actually optimize the system, uh, not only for geometry, but for housing, for uh, salt water, etc. Here is um, um, some of the equipment that we have already either designing or acquired to really start implementing the other spectrometers. For example, uh, in situ alpha spectrometry is uh, one of a kind, it's the first one that has to be built. The first time ever for a marine environment, and the hotspot localization can be a pixelized CCD detector that can really uh, identify as a camera hotspots, for example, radioactive waste if possible inside the marine environment. For the forecast, um, I think I mentioned already the risk information system. This is really important to understand everything. This has to be a, a synergetic project between measurements, between simulations, policies that exist, or policies to be shaped, and really you have to do it in a very concise harmonized way between uh, different sets of data, multimodal data that will exist and will collect uh, side by side with the reactivity and to get something going um, um, that it can be meaningful for local authorities, for international organizations, try to get new standards out, especially for the marine environment. This is very important if we'd like to really invest on the resilience and the sustainability of, uh, of, um, of the marine environment. Ramon's partners are, uh, and I'm closing with this, uh, is a dynamic consortium, has eight partners. Here I mentioned a few, all of them actually. Uh, we lead the project here in the University of Athens, but we have uh, precious collaborators from Lisbon, um, from Spain, from France, uh, but also from uh, England, um, and our friends here in the Polytechnic next door, and German, of course, Evologix and Plotech from uh, Spain. So. Uh, everybody has a specific role and task, and uh, we have a multi-disciplinary uh, uh, and interdisciplinary approach uh, in a synergetic way and self-complementarity. So, I would like to thank them all for this uh, ability to be here as a webinar uh, giver, and uh, also I would like uh, to thank our funding agency, European Union, in this FET uh, Environmental Intelligence Call uh, that makes makes all this uh, research possible. And uh, I would apologize for the delay. Um, and thank you all for your attention. So, I don't know if there are any questions. I think there was something in the chat before, but I'm not quite sure. No. Okay, so um, I'll take the, the 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 chat here and um, try to get the information out um, for you uh, to your questions. So I have a question: How is the envisioned innovative approach going beyond the state of the art, and why? Uh, I think uh, to this to this one, I would say that um, the innovative approach has to do basically with uh, uh, the size of the of the operations. Uh, we need to be in situ, we have to be autonomous, we have to be long term, we have to be really uh, at the source, we have to roam the oceans and we really get the information as much as possible uh, in a long term. This is a continuous monitoring, 
this happens only at the surface at the state of the art the approaches only happen at the surface with boys with systems that are very static uh, they do their work for the surface water but nobody goes um, down to the i don't know 500 or 1000 meters or even 3500 meters depth to really study the dynamics of the of the processes so we really aim for something which is large scale much bigger uh, picture uh, and this can only be done because we have to invest on innovation Otherwise, we cannot make it. it. This can be power autonomy, it can be um, uh, the, the gliders that really have to, uh, to travel long term and carry all the, um, the um, uh, I'm sorry, carry all the, the, the instruments on. It can be also other uh, instruments, for example, like CTD or, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe in the future other sensors. But the, the thing is that to really make one big advancement on the way you approach this, uh, this problem we have at hand. So it's not a traditional technique. I'm, if I'm going to the, the next question, is this new technology better than traditional techniques? Um, it's better in some aspects because we would like to really go further down to the sea, have to, to really go down to the source of these uh, dynamic processes that we'd like to really uh, put a hand on. Uh, traditional techniques, like in the lab, for example, um, are uh, high resolution. They have good statistics. This is important. Uh, in our case, the statistics may not be good, at least uh, for uh, the the gliders roaming the oceans, but it will provide complementary data, a much larger set in a finer grid, in a 3D volume wa of water. Uh, and I think we're really making also some uh, quite significant advantage. Of course, all our techniques will be validated in the lab, um, especially with resolution detectors for samples we take from, uh, from the marine environment. Uh, to understand the efficiency of the detector, to understand all the dynamics, but also simulate them appropriately to get um, a very nice, very reliable instrument that can provide uh, at a minimal detection activity level uh, all the information we need. Um, so I have another question. Is there any environmental risk from using this technology in the ocean? Uh, our technology, no, is non-invasive. We don't use uh, uh, radioactive sources. We don't use anything that can be really harmful. Instead, we try really to help the oceans. Um, uh, it's environmental friendly, I would say. We don't carry any toxic uh, elements or something that can really endanger the communities uh, of the marine biota. Um, and um, what we try to get also is information, understanding whatever dose might exist because of radioactive uh, substances near the seabed or in the water column, uh, and understand that to understand also the resilience of the oceans, and also take this information. Uh, to understand climate change, which is important, or other di dynamic, geodynamic processes that of interest. So I, I would say, uh, actually, we don't do any harm. Instead, we try to really reduce the harm and risk for the environment. Um, how will you inform the public and the local governments? Uh, will Ramon shape new policies? Yes, um, we will. Uh, once we have data, as I said, we will try to get data-driven uh, decisions. Um, this will uh, be implemented the risk information system we're preparing, and this will be open, open basically to the public. We'll try to get also feedback from uh, international experts communities like IAEA or uh, the Greek Atomic Energy Commission, um, which are also important to, to have uh, along. Um, get all the international uh, policies that exist currently, basically for uh, continental land, but also for marine environment. And try to get new, very detailed, very focused, shape new policy, especially for um, the resilience of the human population and the um, uh, environmental population that um, actually exist in the near uh, potentially risky places uh, and locations. Uh, this is something that, uh, of course, has to be um, shaped along the way. We have started already preparing the fundamental framework where we will put all this information, but also we need to get. Um, not only the risk assessment, but also the risk forecasting, basically warning and alerting communities and people and uh, agencies about potential events that might be harmful and might be risky for populations, for touristic uh, um, reasons or uh, financial reasons also. Uh, this is this is something that we need to, it is very important, I think, and it is basically um, the, the future of this project. Uh, by investing on the innovative aspects of the technology, get reliable data that can be used to really protect the environment of the human population. I think this is um, this sums, wraps it up. Um, so I have another one here. I would like to ask uh, whether swimming near a physical reductive source is dangerous of human health. I understand that depends on the amount of the released reductive dose, doesn't it? Yes, okay. This is uh, a yes and no, I would say. 
If you go, for example, to a mineral spa uh, in Baden-Baden or here in Methana or in some other places in course, I don't know where, uh, you can probably swim there without any problem. The radioactivity dose for this kind of uh, environments, for example, um, mineral springs, are uh, basically minimal. They don't induce any real um, risky dose for the human population. So they're considered safe, otherwise they wouldn't be open. Uh, uh, of course, uh, one um, for the natural for the natural radioactive sources, uh, this is this is uh, I would say for for sure. Even Icaria, who has the highest uh, concentration, highest activity, um, I think in the Mediterranean, uh, maybe wrong a little bit, but at least in in Greece, uh, it's safe to go and really uh, sit down and relax uh, in the spa. Um, however, if you would like to go to I don't know a pool of a reactor and just uh, stay there for a few uh, hours near the something which is really um, more intense. One has to be, of course, um, careful. Uh, however, all the precautions we take in this uh, industrial uh, level uh, operations of nuclear power plants uh, have already taken into this account. That's why if you see you have a large pool of water that will surround um, the nuclear fuel. And some in some cases, you can also have a diver really going and uh, repairing stuff. So basically, um, you can estimate the dose and you can estimate also the safety levels either by uh, direct measurements in those extreme cases. You don't really happen to uh, to swim in uh, nuclear power plant pools uh, very often, uh, but also really have to take into um, account simulations of the environment just before you design anything uh, to make um, the safety of and operation of these um, locations um, imminent. So I think I would say uh, yes. If you go to a mineral spring and a spa, go for it. it. Will be good for your uh, arthritis if you have any. Uh, Antonio has. I know there's some work on radonous indicators somewhere in what's it says in coastal regions. What can we learn from the methodology developed so far? Yes, this is important. Um, for the methodologies, we understand uh, basically the imbalance between uh, the, um, the two systems um, uh, when they're connected and communicate. So this means that you have, for example, uh, groundwater discharges that you cannot really see them. You can understand by the amount of radon and the concentration of radon. Uh, if there is an imbalance, if there is a flow, an inflow from the groundwater, or is uh, something else. So you understand basically from the radon uh, as an index, as the proxy measurements, what I, I said before, um, if there is any imbalance in the actual chain, the K chain of radium 226 to radium 222 in the marine environment, for example, influenced by groundwater discharge that has completely different. Um, uh, amount of radon that is being mixed, so it changes what you expect. You either increase it, depending on the dynamics, of course, you either increase it or lower the um, relative ratio between radon and radium, which is the, the mother. And this imbalance can really give you uh, good information. So existing studies um, have confirmed that there are uh, for um, balanced systems, you know exactly what the ratio might be. Any changes can be signifying even um, uh, local sources, uh, pockets that can really give you something from the mandrel or um, uh, streams from some kind of hill that go underneath and get into the uh, into the marine environment. So um, we know a lot from existing studies. The, the thing is, if we have the instruments that can go in situ and monitor for long term, then perhaps this um, uh, this system can be monitored in situ for long term, get time series, and this time series also can give you information how these discharges occur when they occur, if they have a significant uh, change, and so on. There are many things you can uh, you can play after that. So uh, if you can really go in situ, this means a lot for the, um, for the project. So um, I don't know if there are any, any other uh, questions. Ah, there is one, sorry, from uh, Pedro. Is disposal of radioactive waste on the seabed legal in containers? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> Depends who, who, who does it. Uh, typically, when you're about to <clears throat> when you're about to discharge, uh, you need uh, a special authorization from uh, the legal authorities. So, for example, in France, where it's the most developed country, nuclear country in uh, in Europe, um, uh, every now and then there is a decision on how to dispose nuclear waste, and of course, it takes a long a long time preparation for that. How to do it? how to store it, where to store it. Um, it doesn't happen that often, often anymore because now that you also have a continental, you have some depositories also in land. 
but uh, from time to time there are controlled re releases. So if it's something like a big load of barrels, then you need uh, specially designed uh, operations. For example, these uh, pictures I showed you with the barrels come from 84. This is the last um, uh, effort of the French authorities to, to dump radioactive waste in 3,500, uh, something like 600, 700 miles from the French coast in a big uh, deep down there. Um, and uh, nobody knows what happened afterwards. So we would like to really go and explore. And Ramon's technology can be really an asset in estimating this legacy waste. Uh, for other controls releases, you have minute um, releases, for example, mostly gases, xenon and stuff like this from uh, from the reactors to really help the situation and operation of the reactors. But these are typically well be well below um, the um, uh, the legislations. In the case of Fukushima, uh, probably you have heard recently there was uh, some kind of uh, an issue that tried to really get uh, some uh, uh, treated uh, water out to the ocean. Uh, again, this is a big discussion, so this needs really to a good design and uh, to understand if the dose um, released will uh, be cost effective, not only cost effective financially, but also cost effective for the environment, the human population, but also the security of the damaged uh, reactors. Um, so uh, I think very much. Thank you very much, uh, guys um, and girls. As I said, that was the first uh, webinar in the series. I would uh, welcome you all to reach out for Ramones. Um, I would like to implicate experts, uh, governmental officials, but also general public in our operations. It's important for us to get feedback on how we do and what we do, because everything we do is basically for the environment, for the human populations and the resilience of this world. So even if it's about radioactivity, radioactivity is not necessarily harmful. We try to estimate it because it can really give us unique ways of understanding our beautiful planet. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks to all Ramon's partners and uh, thanks for you being here. Um, stay tuned for the next webinar. Thank you all.